and now it is time to get into the draft talk. Let's start with the top 10 tight ends in the 2021 NFL Draft. And it's a good tight end class relative to like the last few years. It's it's not a great class. It's not an exciting class. Very few tight end classes as a whole are. But I would say that the top four tight ends on this list would be my number one tight end last year. My number one tight end last year was Bryson Hopkins, who I believe I had a, a straight up third round grade on. My number four tight end on this list has a third round grade. So maybe Bryson Hopkins would have been fourth. And uh, we'll, we'll see how Hopkins turns out. Uh, he's going to get some opportunities this year for the Rams with Gerald Everett leaving. And, uh, you know, you, you had Adam Troutman was probably the best rookie tight end. Cole Komet showed some flashes. Kind of beating myself up, honestly, that I, I lowered Adam Troutman after his 40 time came out. I originally had him as my number one tight end. I think he ended up fourth. Uh, but anyway, that's besides the point. We're talking about this year's draft class. It's top heavy, and just like most tight end classes, it drops off pretty quickly. But I will say, I've got three sleepers on this list that I think are you guys are going to enjoy hearing about because they're not guys that are being discussed really at all. Uh, let's start with number 10, Trey McKitty. Pretty simple evaluation. I don't get very excited about McKitty. There was some pro day hype for him. I do think he looked like the best uh, tight end kind of there. Uh, I think Hunter Long was there too, who's on this list, who's a better prospect. But Trey McKitty in Mobile kind of looked the part as a intriguing athlete. He's got like 11 inch hands, which show like he's really consistent catching the football. And he's a really good blocker coming out of Georgia, but he's a little undersized and he's not a great athlete. He's got some straight line speed, but he's not like explosive or shifty. He's just, he's fine. He's going to be potentially a number two tight end in the NFL. Really good blocker. Comes in a little undersized at 6'4", 245. Uh, but that allows him to get some leverage in the run game. He's a hard blocker. So he's a fine player. I've got, uh, what, a fifth to a seventh round grade on him. I think he can be a career tight end two type, but no one you're really excited about. And then number nine is kind of the opposite. Tall dude, six foot seven, Zach Davidson, who was completely you know, buried on the, the listing here until the pro day came out. I think he jumped up from like, I don't know, tight end 18, 17 on my list up here to number nine after his pro day scores came out. Now, I was still kind of higher on him. You could see uh, just off the, the small amount of film that I was able to get from him coming out of central Missouri, you could see that he's a, he's a traitsy player. He's six foot seven, extremely tall, but he's not like Tony Poljan or uh, Dylan uh, Siner or Kerry Angeline in this class where they just can't move. Like he can move. He can get open vertical. He can leap up for the football. He's a great red zone threat. And uh, he's kind of similar to like a really young Jimmy Graham as that converted basketball player. Now, I'm not saying he's going to be Jimmy Graham, but he, I do think he has a chance to be a similar player. So let me just read his workout scores. A 464 40-yard dash, which is one of the top in this class. Now he did have a 174 uh, 10-yard split, which is towards the bottom, which showed on tape. He's not like a short area explosive dude. He takes a while with those long legs to get up to that top speed, which it, I'll talk about some of those problems in a, in a minute. But anyway, his three cone at six, uh, sorry. Yeah, 695 three cone, which that's a good time for a receiver or a cornerback. A 426 shuttle, which is I think the highest in this class as far as I can tell. Yeah, I think the shuttle time is the highest in this class. Broad jump, 117 inches, very good. And a 37 and a half inch vertical, which again is tied for first in this class. So the dude has some real high end athletic traits, which you wanna gamble on at tight end because it's just hard to find. So 6'7", 245 pounds, 23, 24 years old, coming out of central Missouri, Zach Davidson. He is a project, he's not ready to play, uh, but you put him, you know, as your tight end three, your tight end four, you maybe use him as a red zone threat, a third blocker, and you bring him along. I would love to see him go to like, say Detroit with Dan Campbell, who to me is the best tight ends coach in the world. So you put Zach Davidson with him, a compliment to TJ Hawkinson, could be exciting. 
So just a trade two player that should be on your radar. I mentioned a little bit of a slow starter. So he's not going to be George Kittle or Travis Kelsey and be a great route runner and a true mismatch problem. But you line him up with that speed over the middle of the field. You can run him on a seam. He's a massive target who can outrun a linebacker going vertically. And with a 38 inch vertical, six foot seven, that's where you get into some of the Jimmy Graham red zone stuff. Like how do you truly cover that if he learns to use his arms well, maybe beat press at the line of scrimmage a little bit uh, and elevate for that football. So a lot of potential there with Zach Davidson, one of the more interesting players on this list. Uh, so someone we're gonna probably spend more time on there than some of these other dudes. Pro Wells is my number eight tight end here. So he's out of TCU and he's a little bit of a late riser. Uh, so he's got that basketball background. I, I don't know if he played at TCU, but I think he was a, a high school basketball player. He he may have played at TCU. Uh, but anyway, I know he has a basketball background. And I guess the, the best comparison for him, and this is a high comp, like this is best case scenario, would be Mo Ali Cox, who is a tight end who was a kind of a NCAA March Madness star who came out of, what was it, VCU or something like that. And he came to the Colts and was a two or a three year project until he really broke out as of like 2019. And he's been a good tight end for them. He is not a top 10 tight end in the NFL, but he's kind of an underrated player, outstanding ball skills. And what, what was the biggest deal for Mo Ali Cox was that he committed himself to the blocking aspect of it and that's really the question with Pro, well, Pro Wells, because neither Mo Ali Cox or Pro Wells are burners. I think Pro Wells, yeah, he ran, he ran a 484. So like they're not great straight line speed guys, but they can leap, they can box out, they're really well built. Um, but as receivers, they're not like true number one mismatch problems at tight ends. So you kind of got to be a tight end too. You got to learn to block really well. And then you turn into a nice role player for your offense, which is exactly what Mo Ali Cox is. And I think Pro Wells has a chance to get there. He's kind of a late riser. He's got that career trajectory you look for. He beat out another NFL prospect on this list, Artavius Lynn, who got buried all the way down at 24 on this list because Pro Wells took that job by the horns. And uh, yeah, Pro Wells, decent, interesting prospect, basketball background. But again, a fifth, sixth round pick and a project. Now we're starting to get a little more towards day one contributors here. And my next player here is a total sleeper. And I don't know if he's going to have a, a rise here in the next couple weeks because it tends to happen when, when a guy truly does pop on film. Sometimes guys get um, uh, analysts start to watch these guys and the buzz starts to circulate. And it's possible that I just got into this tight end class a little earlier than other people. But anyway, this dude popped to me, Jack Stoll out of Nebraska. And the first thing I noticed with him was his get off, his willingness as a blocker. And honestly, he had some speed. And the problem with Jack Stoll is in his senior year at Nebraska, he, he lost his starting job basically because of injuries. He was battling some stuff. He was kind of in and out of the lineup. And by the time he got healthy by the end of the year, Nebraska's season was toast. It was a COVID year. And I, I believe this is just kind of speculation, but it seemed to me that the Nebraska staff was like, Jack, you've had a nice career here, but we're going to play the younger dude. I think they have a sophomore or a junior behind him who they wanted to kind of get ready for next year, which I can't blame Nebraska, but it is what it is. And I ended up, after hearing that, going back to his 2019 tape where he was a full-time starter. He's just a really good tight end. He doesn't thrive as a receiver, but he's got some speed. And what do you know? He comes out at his pro day, runs a 4.6840, a 1.6410 yard split, and boom, there's some athleticism in there. So the eye test matches the physical traits, which you love to see. Doesn't always happen with NFL prospects. But I love that aspect of it. And most importantly, he's a hell of a blocker. He's one of the best blockers in this class. Even after I kind of tagged him as my number seven tight end, as a sleeper in this class, I was going in and watching, it, it might've been Baron Browning or Pete Werner. Anyway, it was someone on the Ohio State defense. And 
what do you know? There's Jack Stoll in another game that I hadn't done, just blocking dudes out of the stadium. And I'm like, God, that guy can really play football. So a derailed collegiate career with injuries and COVID and the program at Nebraska being in a transition. Uh, but keep an eye on Jack Stoll as uh, potentially even an undrafted free agent. I mean, this guy is not on the people's radar. He, when I looked at the consensus rankings, I think he was in the 20s, which is not a draftable tight end. So a total sleeper, uh, but check out Jack Stoll. He can, he can definitely play some football. I would vouch for him in the draft room. I've actually got a fifth round grade on him. I think he honestly has starter traits. He's 260 pounds. He's got good speed. It's not like he has terrible hands. He's not like a polished receiver or anything. But uh, yeah, I think he's got a good chance to to be a good NFL tight end. Not a, Maybe not a starter, but a good player. Then number six here, another huge sleeper. So Jack Stoll and Briley Moore are maybe top five sleepers for me in this class just because these guys are just not on anybody's radar like again these are undrafted free agents in most people's eyes and i've got them as fifth round players with starter upside and briley moore everyone's looking for that baby gronk or the modern tight end that kind of does everything where he run blocks he's a beast after the catch he can get open he can uh, come down with contested catches that's what i saw in briley moore i was really impressed and again, just like Jack Stoll, it, it, I saw the speed on tape. I projected him to run a 4.85, though, because I was like, ah, no one's talking about this dude. He's probably not an athlete. Uh, but I, I did see some separation and some toughness after the catch and some juice. And there you go. He runs 4.66 at his pro day. That's why he stands out. So both these guys... The athletic testing kind of matching to me what stood out when I was watching these two players, Briley Moore and Jack Stoll, compared to, you know, your John Bates, Kerry Angeline, Quentin Morris, Nick Eubanks, this long list of just redshirt senior tight ends that don't have a lot of juice, that barely did anything in college. And these were the guys to me that was like, they stand out. So Briley Moore, like I said, He's got that baby Gronk profile where he kind of does everything. He is a badass as a blocker. He wants it. He wants to play that role. And he really wants it with the ball in his hands. He's a he's a beast after the catch. Uh, so if you're if you want like a, a guy that could be like last year's Adam Troutman, who kind of surprises some people, I think Briley Moore could be that guy. Now, the only knock here I will say is he actually weighed in at 240 after um i think it was listed at like 255 i can actually click right here on my draft board and get that link to his player bio so let's see i think it was listed a little heavier it was listed at 250 at kansas state so that could explain a little bit of the speed gap there list uh estimating him to run in the four eights and he comes out runs four six uh dropping 10 pounds there Maybe you want to meet in the middle there a little bit, give up a little bit of that speed for a little more of the toughness and uh, that size. But regardless, I was really impressed by his tape. And not to mention, you never know what weight these guys actually play at. He could have been playing at 240. So I don't look too much into that, but it is a note. But uh, yeah, Briley Moore, Jack Stoll to me, big sleepers in this class. Then my number five tight end is Tommy Tremble. And he's Josiah DeGuara. That's who he is. A lot of Packers fans obviously know who jo Josiah DeGuara is, but a lot of draft geeks know who he is because he was kind of a reach for the Green Bay Packers. But that said, a team like the Packers, who's, who values blocking and flexibility at that tight end position, kind of looking at the Niners and trying to replicate that system, they saw a tight end with really good athleticism and outstanding blocking willingness and technique. That's Tommy Tremble in a nutshell. Now, Tremble might be a little bit of a better athlete, but that's my comp. He's 6'3", 240 pounds. He's kind of half fullback, H-back. He could potentially be uh, as good as, say, a... Uh, oh, who's the tight end for the Vikings? What's his name? Irv Smith. He That might be like a high-end comp for him, who Irv has himself turned into a really good blocker and a vertical threat in the receiving game in that same system. So he's somewhere on the Josiah DeGuara, who we don't really know how good he's going to be yet, by the way, to Irv Smith spectrum. And uh, I estimated him to run 4.6. He ran 4.65. He's just 
really good athlete, great blocker, incredibly underutilized in the receiving game, which is, you know, he's unproven as a receiver. I wouldn't say he's like a great route runner or anything, but we've seen a George Kittle. We've seen lots of tight ends actually kind of be underutilized in college for whatever reason in the receiving game get to the nfl the role changes and then all of a sudden they show that they have really good traits as a receiver so he is a bit of a i don't want to say a boomer bust prospect i think he's got a nice floor if used in the correct role i would just say he has some fog of war because he was so underutilized in the receiving game hard to say for sure kind of how steady his hands are going to be how much his route running is going to develop how much of a consistent contested catch player can he be And even like how great after the catch is he going to be. So there's some, I would just say fog of war with his evaluation because we just didn't see him utilized a ton. He he probably, um, I'm I'm just kind of going off of deep memory here, but I think he only had like 20 catches in college. Uh, Maybe had more than that, but yeah, that's Tommy Tremble in a nutshell. I've got a third to a fourth round grade on him. I'm maybe a little bit lower on Tremble, uh, but you know, I, I like him as a player. I think he's going to be a good player in the right role. Then my number four tight end is Hunter Long. And this is a very simple evaluation. He is Kyle Rudolph to me, which sounds great. But honestly, Kyle Rudolph, without dogging on him, because he's a good football player, but quite possibly one of the most overrated players of the decade, Kyle Rudolph. He's like a Pro Bowl MVP, which the casual fans are going to drool over. He catches touchdowns. He's constantly like a top 10 fantasy tight end because he's a stable option those touchdowns in fantasy football mean way more than pretty much anything else especially a tight end so that to me is hunter long he is a tall unathletic possession tight end he's got extremely steady hands contested catch galore like he's gonna box you out come down with some tough catches and he's a decent blocker, just like Kyle Rudolph. Now, he doesn't have a ton of like short area juice, which is a part of reason why Kyle Rudolph has struggled at times as a blocker because he's not a great athlete. At some point to block someone in the NFL, yes, you got to be big and strong, but you also got to be able to get out of your stance quickly uh, and arrive with some momentum. And in those short areas, a guy like Kyle Rudolph, Hunter Long, it's just going to be tough for them to be a dominant blocker like a George Kittle who flies off the ball or a Tommy Tremble who we just talked about who can fly off the ball and come up and hit you like a fullback basically. So, you know, Hunter Long is a third round prospect for me. I mentioned he very well may have been the number one tight end in last year's class. I think he would have been right there with some of those other dudes at the top. Um, But my number three tight end is Brevin Jordan who my comparison for him is Janu Smith, though I'm not sure he's quite as athletic. Uh, Maybe Gerald Everett. Actually, I did. I I changed it after his 40 time uh, and his overall workout with the other splits. It just wasn't amazing. So I changed the comp from Janu Smith, who's a phenomenal athlete, to Gerald Everett, who is above average as an athlete. I would actually say Gerald Everett is is a good to great athlete, whereas Janu Smith is more of a elite athlete at the tight end position. Uh, but anyway, Brevin Jordan, 6'3", 246 pounds. So uh, is a little bit undersized. Isn't going to be a, a true like like Hunter Long. He's not going to be a guy that is a red zone threat necessarily, a true contested catch guy. But what he does bring to the table is the speed to run away from linebackers. And frankly, his best trait is run after catch ability. So put him in a similar situation to Johnny Smith or the way Gerald Everett is going to be used in Seattle in that Shanahan offense. I consistently mock him to Tennessee as a Johnny Smith replacement. And the reason these guys work so well uh, as those undersized guys in the Shanahan offense is a, they typically are better blockers than you, you project because they, they come in with leverage at six, three, six, four, and they fly off the ball and they are really strong and thick and built. So as an underrated blocker in those sort of moon move block offenses, and then you pair that play action where you get, you, you start getting a linebacker going the other way. And then you sneak that tight end back across his face. I don't care if you're Isaiah Simmons. If you get a guy that flies off the ball, like Brevin Jordan, who can sneak out on those play actions, 
you're probably not catching up to Brevin Jordan. And then you get him open, you scheme him open like that, and look out after the catch, because Brevin Jordan will put a stiff arm on you, he'll run you over, he's fast. So really good tight end, a little bit scheme specific, kind of in that Irv Smith situation with Minnesota, who is in this system, Johnu Smith, Gerald Everett, you name it. This is the archetype. Even Josiah DeGuara is kind of what Green Bay was looking for, even though Brevin Jordan is just a much more physically imposing uh, prospect than like a Josiah DeGuara or a Tommy Tremble on this list. Uh, so I like him. I've got a second to a third on grade on him still. Now he got shredded for his pro day. A 46840 is still pretty good. And his split was 159, which is that the highest in this class? It is third in this class. So he still has a good first step. He accelerates quickly. Maybe the top speed isn't quite what you look for, but I still believe in the tape as him as a really good tight end prospect who would have been the best tight end in last year's class. Then my number two tight end is Pat Fryermuth, who's a polarizing player, uh, a junior coming out. So a lot of people aren't in love with Pat Fryermuth because he didn't have a ton of production. And that's basically it. He, he got injured in his junior season, so he missed a lot of time. And he's a projection, but he's a very safe projection in my opinion. I He would have easily been the number one tight end last year. And uh, I think he's kind of an underrated player. Now, some people really like him. Some people are probably higher on Pat Fryermuth than me, but probably not a lot. I'm pretty damn high on this player. So if you're looking for that baby Gronk, it's Pat Frymuth. His blocking is exceptional. He has a really nice first step. So a lot of the stuff we talked about with some of these slower tight ends, maybe not being great blockers. I'm not worried about that with Pat Frymuth. He's a willing blocker as well. He's got the size at 250 pounds. Now he... He lost a little weight. He was up at 260, and he moved really well at 260 pounds. I maybe like him even better at 250, where he might even be more athletic. Uh, so there's some fog of war here, and there's some projection with Pat Fryermuth. But the reality is, you don't find athletes like Pat Fryermuth at tight end, especially young ones. He's a junior. He's barely played football. Keep in mind. Pretty much everyone on this list is a senior or a redshirt senior. It takes time for these guys that a lot of them are receivers in high school. It takes a, a time for them to put on weight, learn how to block. It is a very much a developmental position as a whole. Like not a lot of tight ends come in as freshmen and dominate uh, as a, um, well freshmen in, in college especially, but um, rookies in the NFL. It's a position that takes time to groom. So to get an athlete that was better on the field than any tight end on this list, because our number one tight end is not really, he's, he is a tight end, but he's not a tight end. But he, as a true tight end, hand in the dirt consistently, Pat Fryermuth was, was the best tight end on this list as a junior. He's got the freaky athletic traits. Now the production's not there. But you know who the production also wasn't there for? George Kittle. It wasn't there for... Uh, other guys I like in the NFL as well, like Foster Moreau and uh, who's the guy in Buffalo that I like as well that's that's growing. He's coming along. Uh, oh, man, what's his name? This is going to bother me. I'm going to look this up. Oh, gosh, what's his name? I loved him in that draft class, too. Knox, Knox. I found it before I before it came up on the screen. I did think about it. Dawson Knox. Anyway. You don't always have to have college production to project as a starting caliber NFL tight end. Now, Pat Fryermuth, to me, he has the upside of Mark Andrews, Travis Kelsey, to be that baby Gronk type of dude. I think he's a better blocker than Mark Andrews, and he's an athlete of the caliber of Travis Kelsey. So definitely a high-end, high-potential tight end prospect. I was super impressed with his run-after catch ability, his speed, his blocking ability, there's a lot to work with there already. I think he's a better prospect based on his college tape than Mark Andrews was. I can't really speak about Travis Kelsey so much, um, but I, I really think he's a player that should go in the first round because he you just don't find these traits and the willingness to block and the run after catch. Like He is a physically minded, tough dude with the physical traits to complement it. I'm kind of glowing about Pat Fryermuth because a lot of people aren't in on him. Like Jags fans, for example, they constantly get mocked Pat Fryermuth at 25. I think that's what happens because their tight end coach went to Jacksonville. It's a glaring need. 
They have receivers. They need another weapon for Trevor Lawrence. Like, that's the spot. I, I really do think uh, when I do my what I think happens mock draft right before the draft, Pat Fryer moved to 25 to Jacksonville is kind of the spot. And I love that fit for him. Um, but Jags fans don't like that because they think they can get Pat Fryermuth with the 45th pick. You can't. You're not getting Pat Fryermuth. I think he goes in the first round. If not, he's not getting past, uh, in, in my opinion, he's not getting past Jacksonville at 33. He's not getting past um, the Jets at 34 as a candidate. The, the, even the Panthers at like 38 could use a tight end. He, he's going in the first 38 picks in the draft. I would bet my money on that. Uh, so there are people that are with me on that, but that's the sales pitch for people that don't think he belongs in the top 40. And I definitely think he does. I get that the production was not there, but tight end is a almost impossible position to find. And it's a position where you need to project growth. No tight end coming out of college is, is Rob Gronkowski. You got to grow them. You got to groom them. Uh, so the number one tight end is, is Kyle Pitts. No surprise there. Uh, he's... Man, where do you even start with Kyle Pitts? He's an offensive weapon. He's a, a versatile weapon. He, he's more of a tight end, uh, more of a receiver than a tight end. I think he played 91% of his snaps as a receiver. But it's it's fun to say that. It's fun to joke that he's not actually a tight end. But when he puts his hand in the dirt, he's a willing blocker. He can get in players' way. He has size. He's 245 pounds. It's not like he's, you know, 230 pounds and he's just going to get manhandled. Like he, he's very slim, but he's very functionally strong. So he can block. I've got him with a D plus run blocking grade as a tight end. If you listed him as a receiver, he'd have A plus blocking, if that makes sense. Like he is willing, strong, and long, and he gets off the ball quickly, and he can develop that a little bit. I don't think. I wouldn't have him gain weight. I wouldn't have him go up to 255 pounds. I wouldn't play him as a full-time tight end, but he can do that. He can line up, put his hand in the dirt and play tight end. But just like say Mike Gesicki for the Miami Dolphins, who played 9% of his snaps at tight end, which I think is almost identical to what Kyle Pitts did at Florida. That's the role, slot receiver, outside receiver. And in certain packages, he will be kind of that, second tight end i don't know if they call that the h tight end because i i would need to i would need to look at a playbook but uh and i should i should know that so maybe i need to look that up but the number two tight end who's kind of flexed off the line of scrimmage instead of uh putting his hand in the dirt as the guy next to the tight end kind of that guy that's off the line uh, as that kind of wing tight end often in a two-point stance not a three-point stance that's where kyle pitts fits as a tight end um but Man, just as a receiver, incredible. Like a guy at six foot six, 245 pounds. He's one of the best route runners in this class, period, at receiver or tight end. He's got shake in his routes, especially like his ability to change direction when he's at full speed. It's better than most cornerbacks. Like he he has rare physical traits. He's smart. He's tough. He has the best hands in this class, period, even more than Jamar Chase. If he's double covered, you just high point it. And he has, what, a 40? I guess his vertical is only 33 and a half. I'm mixing him up with Jamar Chase. But he broke the wingspan record for an offensive player, uh, a, a, a receiver or a tight end receiver. He broke the wingspan record. Like he has a 80, like an 82 inch wingspan or something ridiculous. And it shows on tape. His ability to like flip his hips and catch comebacks. It, I, I could go on and on and on about the different ways you can use Kyle Pitts. He is, to me, the best player in this class, at least tied with Jamar Chase. I'm um, looking at my grade. I do. I currently have the highest grade in this class on Kyle Pitts, a 7.4. He's a blue chip prospect. I, I'm just glowing. He is unbelievable. There's no way he should get past eight with the uh, Carolina Panthers. If he's there, you got to grab him. I think Atlanta's a candidate to take him at four. I'm not entirely ruling out the freaking 49ers taking him at three. I You don't give up all that picks for a non-quarterback, but 
it, Jimmy Garoppolo could do just fine with those weapons and that offensive line. So I'm not even ruling him out. The Niners trading up for him and just doing all his quarterback stuff is as kind of a, a disguise. I don't think it's likely, but I think there's a one or a two percent chance that that's the case. I wouldn't rule him out to the Bengals at five. I wouldn't rule him out to the Dolphins at six, even though they have Mike Gesicki. You'd have to get really creative to work both those guys into your offense because they're almost identical roles. Uh, seven, Detroit. It's probably not going to happen unless someone traded up for him. But then Carolina at eight, you can't let this guy go. So uh, he's not like other tight end prospects. He is a, an elite mismatch problem. And again, the best player in this draft class. I, I can't say enough about Kyle Pitts. So this is the top 10 tight ends. And I am going to clip this into a YouTube video. So if you are watching this video, please do hit that like button and come check out the podcast because we're about to talk about the top 10 offensive, interior offensive linemen in the class. 